Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Nerd to the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things be and awesome. I'm your host and master of ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, in this epic quest of awesomeness is our resident anime goddess, the cat. Cat, how are you doing? Yes, since I'm all right. I'm all right. Okay. All right. And uh, also back after a lengthy absence is Skyblaze. Uh, Skyblaze, how have you been? Um, everything is very wobbly. <laughs> Really? Uh, wait, why is that? You've been hitting the patine a little hard? Uh, I wish it was something not that entertaining. No, I have labyrinthitis. But... Which basically means permanent vertigo. Okay, uh, so it's 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 not uh, seeing visions of David Bowie? Sadly, no. That would be much, much better. <laughs> Alright, well, glad to, glad to see you here with us and, uh, and, and, and standing upright. So uh, yeah, good to good to see good to see have you back. And uh, for those of you wondering where Brian has been, uh, he has released his second video log, uh, second Q and A video, which we're going to include a link to uh, below the YouTube feed. So he's picked up some Ask Geek questions that uh, he's answering, and uh, give you an update on where he's at. And as for us, we got a fun show for you guys tonight. We are discussing uh, the new Marvel film Ant Man and the Wasp, so, so which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, very very fun film. I'm uh, looking forward to discussing it. But of course, there is procedure to follow, so we're going to begin with the random topic of the week. And for this week's topic, so I'm at—I was at the dentist the other day, getting my uh, my bi-yearly cleaning, uh, which was normally an exercise in terror because, as I think I've mentioned on the sh- on the show, uh, I'm fucking terrified of my dentist. Uh, I think dentists in general are just evil beings who are just not happy unless you go home bleeding. So as I'm lying in that chair and my hygienist is uh, shoving bits of metal in my mouth. And uh, scraping out my teeth, uh, my eye just kind of wanders to the other end of this hook that she's using, and my eyes just lock, target acquired, on this hook. And the wheels start spinning in my head, and I, I start getting ideas about this hook. And after she finishes, and my dentist comes in to do the the post cleaning checkup, I ask him, you know, Doc, how much do these hooks normally run for? And it's like, why do you ask? I was like, well, is this, is, this, is this as fine as they get? Because I like to see what I have to do to buy a couple of these to use for cleaning out my game controllers. Because, and Kat, I'm sure you, and Kat and Skyblades, I'm sure you guys have seen this because you follow me on Facebook. I've gotten really big lately into cleaning out my game, my retro game hardware. Um, and one of the problems I have is getting down into the detail work, getting down in between the seams of the plastic molding, or especially on like the GameCube waiver, some pictures of, you know, they got all that writing that's engraved into the plastic that I just can't get mm. into with any kind of tool or brush that I have at time. Uh, but one of those, uh, I could get in uh, just fine and get all that stuff out. And here's the part that really mind bl- that blew my mind about this exchange. I'm apparently not the first person to ask him about this. <laughs> He apparently keeps. Yes. He apparently. Ladies he apparently keeps a, uh, a a a box of old uh, two scra- two scraping hooks, which I've since learned are called explorers. Uh, that he donates to hobbyists uh, to use in tools or you know to like beatists for you know for, for their beat work and stuff. So he gave me like two or three of his hooks and sent me on my way. And let me tell you, they work a treat in out these controllers. So for this week's random topic of the week, topic is. What is the most unusual item that you have ever repurposed towards nerdy ends? So, what is what is uh, uh, Skyblaze? I'm sure you you know at least someone who's uh, taken something and repurposed it in some weird way to geeky purposes. So, uh, why don't we start with you? Do you know anything like this? Okay, when you're doing cosplay, literally anything can become a uh, a tool for making weird and wonderful items out of it. Um, things like garden canes and doweling and uh, pasteboard and god knows what else. Uh, all of this have been sacrificed on the altar of cosplay. Uh, the, the strange I'm trying to think what the strangest of them would be. Oh, I did once um, cut apart a DVD case because I needed the, you know, the, the little center inserts. That you, that you actually put the 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 spindle of the CD on and go click. 
Oh, the, the center tab, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did once repurpose some of those for a, um, nefarious cosplay purposes. I was okay. tearing apart this DVD case for one of those. I can't remember what it was for, but I definitely did it. It might have been for a, a badge or something. Okay, alright. Kat, what about you? Have you, have you seen anybody, re- have you or somebody you know or somebody you've seen repurpose anything uh, for unusual purposes? I can tell you the strangest thing that I have ever repurposed is a vacuum cleaner for a cosplay, because Skyblaze is right. When you cosplay, anything can become a, uh, a prop or a piece of a costume. Like, it, if it saves you from having to make something, you will take whatever you can. And uh, I cosplayed from Hunter x Hunter many years ago as a character named Shizuku. And if you've seen Hunter x Hunter, you know what I'm talking about. She carries around this um, this vacuum cleaner that's like a demon vacuum cleaner. It's kind of evil and it's really strange. And um, I turned my parents' old vacuum cleaner that they had recently... Uh, Replace. They'd gotten a new one, and they were going to throw it away. And I'm like, no, 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 save it, save it, save it. I can use it at Otakon this year, which was a long time ago. Um, and I painted it up and made it look terrifying and uh, scared a lot of people out of ever cleaning again. <laughs> um, but it was, like, just a stroke of luck that my parents happened to be getting rid of this old-ass vacuum cleaner at the exact time I was wanting to cosplay someone that had a <laughs> vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, this, this is just something that, like, because it, it, this this topic came up again, because like I said, before this whole you know demo ex- experience, I wouldn't have thought at all of getting a set of these hooks uh, to clean my controllers. And like you know, as a collector, one of the things that I'm really kind of you know leery about is doing anything that might damage the controllers. And one of the things I love about these hooks is that because they're designed to get into small places but still be gentle on your teeth, I can be as rough as I want with these hooks on my WaveBird uh, or my PS3 controller, and they won't leave any scratches or any marks whatsoever. And it's great, and I absolutely love it. So we want to hear from you guys. What is the the weirdest thing that you have repurposed towards nerdy ends? Uh, It could be something that you did for a a cosplay or something that you repurposed... Uh, you know, maybe you took like an old uh, appliance and turned it into a tower for a, a D and D game. Whatever. What is the weirdest thing that you have ever repurposed t- to nerdy ends? And so, with that, we're going to move right on into our Ask a Geek, and we've got several questions here. Uh, first question here is uh, this one is from Riley, and it is Skyblaze uh, to you and to me. And the question uh, is actually regarding something we were discussing before the recording. And the question is, Is are we aware of the HD cable that's been released for the Sega Dreamcast? And have we had a chance to play around with it? And what do we think that this will do for Dreamcast collecting? So, uh, Skyblaze, I think I'll let you have the, the floor on this one since uh, you're the, the big Sega fan. I've not had a, a personal experience of it yet. Um, my Dreamcast is currently connected to my TV through uh, RGB SCART. Uh, for those who are in America who might not be familiar with SCART as much as those in Europe, um, SCART is uh, an RGB format which was developed in France, and it gives you about the best picture you can have in standard definition for a, an old console. The upgrade to HD looks pretty cool. The only thing that slightly concerns me is whether or not there's going to be any input lag. The videos so, so I've seen suggest not, but that does concern me a bit. As for the impact it will have... I don't know, it's hard to say. Uh, I think if we if you can get like that combined with, say, a Dream Pi, and access to some of the fan servers, that would be pretty awesome. If you could have a little package. I think that would have a significant impact on the, the collector's market. I suspect it'll pro- the, the HD cables will probably have more of an impact in the US, where the SCART cables are a lot rarer. Um, no, let, let, me, let me be clear. The SCART cables, you can find anywhere. It's the SCART TVs that are rare as shit. <laughs> yeah, um, to this day, you can still get TVs in the UK, which have SCART sockets by standard in the back. Apparently that's not a thing in the US, and I really don't understand why. But hey, yeah, no, we never we never got the SCART standard over here. Uh, for us, it was a uh, component, which was the the red, yellow, white, <laughs> or or RGB comp- or RGB component. 
Um, we never got SCART. And then we just jumped from there to uh, HDMI. Um, I'm really excited about uh, these, these these Dreamcast HDMI cables. I'm really excited about basically any time someone managed to work out a way to take an old console and put out and have it put out an H- a picture that looks good on HD TVs. Because let's be totally honest, I mean, old CRT t- TVs, yeah, you can still find them, uh, but there's a there's a ticking death clock on all of those. They're not going to last forever. Um, and I love seeing all, all these cables, come, these HD solutions for retro consoles come out, especially for like that Xbox, GameCube, Dreamcast era that was kind of right on the cusp just before HD became a big thing. Um, so we got the Dreamcast controller, and then the same company also put out one for the original Xbox a few months back that also worked really well from everything I've seen. And then you've also got the Eon GameCube HD adapter, um, which the one complaint I had with that is that you have to have one of the early GameCube models that had the RGB port as well as component video port uh, in order for it to work. The later models, they only had the one port. You need to have both for the for the adapter. So it's, you know, stuff like this really excites me because, you know, it, it gives us a chance to go back and enjoy these older games, these older consoles on modern televisions and not have them look like complete crap. And I, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I was kind of have to raise my eyebrow at or get kind of frustrated with whenever someone new is thinking about getting into retro collecting or playing some of these older games like you know i'd love to play some of these older games but they just look like total crap on a on on a modern television and you know it 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 kind of goes back to something that we kind of touched on in our last episode which is that like you know if if there's a demand for it geeks will find a way to make it happen uh, so this is this is one of the more of those things that I just get really impressed by the the nerd community that we you know people are showing such passion for these older consoles that they're coming up with these solutions to to bring them into modern age so uh, yeah that's that question and then uh, let's see uh, let's find one here for Kat since she's been sitting here listening to me and Skyblaze ramble on about video games <laughs> hey, Skyblaze hasn't been here for a while she needs to catch up on questions <laughs> that's true all right well then okay then let's go ahead and run her through the gauntlet. let's see we've got a uh... problem you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. We uh, there was another one here that uh, uh, came from the E3 show, and I'm trying to find it here. <laughs> oh God, E3! Hmm. The week that sleep forgot. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, so Skyblaze, we got one here uh, from Erica, and she asks uh, why you didn't have much to say about the VR front at E3 this year. What VR front? <laughs> no, seriously, we did a lot of work at E3, but not uh, well during E3 week. The guys who were writing all the material, and we included, at work were doing a lot of um, writing. Very little of it was about the stuff that was actually at E3 because there wasn't a lot. Even some of the stuff that we were like 95% certain before E3 was going to involve VR, like the the Resident Evil remake, we were told that it was going to include VR, and then it didn't. And we were like, um, shit, well, all of these prepared articles are going in the bin then. Yeah, I remember you, I remember you touching on that on the E3 show. Yeah. I still I, I still say that I don't think VR for RE2 is out of the cards just yet. I, I think got... they've made it, they've made it a lot harder for themselves because of the third person perspective. But it could they could do they could make it work, but yeah, they have made a rod for, them, for their own back if they do want to include VR on it. Okay. And then uh, she's actually got a second question here for you, and uh, that question is, as a as an avid Dun- Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop player, what is the weirdest set of dice you have ever seen? Weirdest set? Um... <sighs> I'm going to say right now, if you're, you're going to tell me that you've seen a set made from human bone, I don't want to hear about it. I just feel like that would cause a lot of legal problems. Us. I've definitely seen those on Etsy, just saying. <laughs> I have seen them, but they were in a museum, so... Um, <laughs> I I have a set of uh, what are referred to as tablet dice, which are the kind of the cylindrical-looking dice. Uh, they're quite odd. Um, I have a friend of mine who's got a 
whose dice just have symbols on. Um, the storytelling dice things that have got like there's a, a chalk outline and a, a gun and a I can't remember what oh else oh the, the 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 right the writer's the 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 writer's block best friend yeah <laughs> there's various things like like that um, there's another friend of mine who had an entire set of solid steel dice that made dents in the table whenever he rolled them God yeah they they were loud as well. We finally, like, just stop, please. My ears. Doesn't he have a dice tray? I think that would just make the problem even worse. Probably. Steel on steel. No, a, a dice tray, like a like a the little cloth mat ones. Yeah. Like I made my own dice tray because I'm getting into D and D again, and you know, like you just line the bottom with felt, and it absorbs noise and bounce. You can, you can also get um, there's a company in Sheffield that do uh, these little things that have got, you know, the little poppers at each corner. So you you clip together, they're, they're square and you clip together the corners and it makes a little tray for you to put your dice in. And then when you're done, you can actually just fold it up and uh, clip it together and it will put, put nicely into a pencil case or something. Yeah, there you go. Dice mat. They're okay. awesome. You can. You, they also double as mouse mats if you're short on a mouse mat. All right, uh, Kat, What about you? Since you're uh, getting into D and D, have you seen any weird or unusual dice? Well, besides the one made of human bone that I saw on Etsy, that I think was found in a serial killer's house. I, I, I am, for the sake of my sanity, uh, telling myself that you were being sarcastic when you said that. So please leave me to my to my pleasant delusion. <laughs> I'm just saying, when you search for dice on Etsy, sometimes you get results you didn't expect. <laughs> um, no, I haven't really, in person, seen any unusual dice. Um really nice dice lots of dice that i want and maybe getting for my birthday but um not really just the just the stuff i've seen online that's a little that's a little weird they have some unusual like metal sculpted ones that look really cool but the numbers are really hard to read and i just think uh... my eyes are too poor to uh to like stare at my dice for too long to try and figure out what number i'm looking at I do have a friend who has a set of odd numbers dice. Interesting. Like, like it only has odd numbers on it? No, as in, uh, like a D7. Oh. oh. I, I thought it had all odd numbers on it for some reason. No. Okay. Um. Now, the most, the most out there set of dice I've ever seen was a set uh, I, I found for sale of solid gold dice uh, going for about $3,000. Which, if you bring those to your table, uh, you no longer have any excuse to not contribute towards the weekly snack budget after that. If you can, <laughs> if you can bring that kind of bling, you can afford to bring for cheese curls. <laughs> okay. And uh, let's see here now. Uh, see, find another one. There was another good tabletop one here uh, for your Skyblaze. I'm trying to find it. Uh, oh, here we go. All right, and uh, well, it's not addressed specifically to you, uh, but this one is from Bob, and he asks all of us, "What would be our dream game table?" So, Skyblaze, since you're uh, the most experienced with, with uh, tabletop games, uh, what would be your dream gaming table? What 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 design and features would you implement? Oh, um, what I'd actually like is um, something like a a light field projector above it. Um, so you can actually just have augmented reality uh, projections on it. Uh, so like oh, you're in a castle, one there's a castle, and it'll have like the little um, grid patterns on it, and you can switch it to hex patterns if you particularly want. Now, see, I was just going to say cup holders, and then she comes out with that. <laughs> and now I just feel dumb. <laughs> <laughs> also, a rim around the outside edge so dice don't go flying off into the fucking ether. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, d- d- dice catching bridges is always an important feature. All right, Kat, what about you? What's your what's your dream gaming table? Um, definitely what Skyblaze said. Not necessarily that technologically savvy, but I have seen um, tables with projectors like mounted on the ceiling so that you can basically have your map projecting down on the table which is just really cool um, yes. I'd, I'd love a, a tabletop that actually had some terrain on it 
Um, because my friends, we just, you know, use like basic grid and stuff. Um, cup holders sound really nice, but, but would not probably fit my giant mug. Um, <laughs> cup holders in the chairs, surely. Yeah, um, something. Um, something, you know, would be really fun would be to have like a built in dice tower. Maybe one that like pops up or something, and then if you're not playing a, a dice based game, you can just like push it into somewhere or something. Oh, it's like um, my TV cabinet has those little doors where you push them and they go click and they open and then you push them again and they, they click and go close, something like that. Yeah, for a dice like tower. that, but like a pop-up dice tower that just, you know, like you just put your dice in there and it comes out. And then if you don't need it, it can just and retract it back into the table or something. Or, or, or maybe a little rack on the side for the dice, a dice rack. Well, well this like, would be like, like you for rolling in- the dice. A lo- uh, you could have it like you have in pool with a little uh, little rail underneath. Only, you know, it'll be a little channel for you're rolling your dice on. <laughs> Maybe with cameras so the GM can check that you're not cheating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Cool, cool. All right. Well, like I said, the best idea I'd come up with was cup holders. Um, because I can tell you many a tale of uh, during the, the brief period where uh, I was in a dark heresy group where one of us uh, went to go roll our dice and they wound up knocking over our sodas and soaking uh, the GM's nicely drawn map. So... Whenever I... And, 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 we wondered, and we wondered why he kept asking for a laminator for his birthday. Whenever uh, I was playing tabletop games, I usually ended up sitting on somebody uh, on, on a chair with the map on the floor. And we were usually drinking beer, not soda. <laughs> but that tells you a lot about the sort of people I play D&D with, really. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the SD questions that we have for this week. Thank you, as always, for and as well to the email at drgonzo at nerd of the third power dot com. And uh, if you're Jonesing for some Ask a Geek uh, this week, uh, remember, uh, Brian has put out his second Ask a Geek video, which we've got a link below uh, the YouTube feed for that if you want to go and find out, uh, some, hear some of his comic questions. So yeah, that's all the Ask Geek questions we have for this week. Thank you for sending them in. And with that, we're going to jump right into our discussion topic this week, which is Ant-Man and the Wasp, the latest Marvel film, uh, and the first one since Infinity War. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's kind of, you kind of because this movie's kind of in a weird place in that it it, it has to follow such a, uh, such a, such a huge act. So did it manage to be a... Uh, did it manage to be a giant success, or was it just a teeny tiny failure? So uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, discussing this film. Uh, let's just start with our general thoughts on this film. So, uh, Kat, what did you think of Ant-Man and the Wasp? Oh, God, it was really fun. Um, especially after the the really heavy Infinity War film, it was nice to go back to, bounce back to something fun and exciting like Ant-Man, where you, you know... You watched it, and like any other Marvel f- film, you really weren't too worried about the main character dying. You were just like, oh, that wacky Scott, what's he going to do next? Um, <laughs> so it was like a big like breath of fresh air, since the, uh, the Marvel fandom has been sort of plagued by terrible death memes lately. <laughs> and uh, really entertaining, a really great follow-up to the previous film. Uh, nicely tied in other films. Um really really good guys like it didn't suffer from sequelitis quite as much as other marvel films have yeah um for me this is the first ant-man film that i've seen still haven't gone back to see the first one uh but i was i you know but i was really really pleasantly surprised by this movie like i'd heard that it that you know the first movie was 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 good but like my perception was that he was, I was afraid that this movie was going to be really silly, and it was to an extent. But it was it was a, it was a, a, a silliness that fit, and uh, there were a lot of moments in this film that I laughed out loud. I, I, this is definitely a, a very funny film, and I very much enjoyed it. Um, and in its in, in its own way, it, had, it 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 kind of shows like like you know like when I discussed in our Jurassic World review that I, I thought that, that movie was dumb. Um, this movie ha- has its dumb moments, but it's a fun kind of dumb that you can get behind. Not kind of a, oh god, why do they go and do that? Like Jurassic World had for me. This 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 is a, this is a very fun movie, and I very much enjoyed it. So uh, I guess let's just start by uh, breaking this movie down into its component parts, starting as always with the plot and script. So uh, Kat, why don't you get us started on a on a brief rundown of this film? 
Right. Uh, so this film takes place uh, before Infinity War, but after Civil War. Um, During- I was trying to think of how many films were in between these two. <laughs> um, um, the story revolves around Scott Lang. Uh, gosh. He has. Uh, he is currently under house arrest due to his participation in this, the Civil War and the violation of the Sokovia Accords. And uh, Hank Pym and Hope Van Dyne are on the run for the same reason, because they are also implicated in everything that happened because Scott was using their technology in the Civil War. So everybody is kind of in a bad place, but Scott is just a couple of days away from his house arrest being over, and so he is trying to be on his best behavior and that's just not allowed to happen because he's Scott and he's got to get into some trouble. <laughs> so, um, in, in the meantime, um, Hank and Hope are furthering research into uh, the quantum realm uh, because, um, oh gosh, this is where science stuff Uh, made up science stuff starts to take place but because Scott had been in the quantum realm in the previous film it seemed possible now that wherever Janet Van Dyne disappeared to when she disappeared um, it was possibly now they might be able to reach her so um, Hank and Hope are trying to figure out a way into the quantum realm to get there safely to navigate it and bring her back Um, and while all of the that is going on. They are being pursued by a new villain called Ghost, and Ghost is trying to steal their laboratory, which can uh, shrink and resize, like just about everything they have. Um, and Hope, or <laughs> and Ghost wants their technology for other reasons that we can get into here in a bit. Um, and once they pop back up on the radar. Uh, the FBI start to get involved with tracking them down, hunting them to try and arrest them. Um, many, many ridiculous hijinks ensue where Scott has to leave his house um, to to go do superhero stuff, leaving behind a giant ant that has been programmed to just do his daily routine forever. Poor ant. <laughs> um, and also, uh, while all of this is going on, Um, Scott's old buddies from the first film who clearly have all been to prison together have now started a business. Uh, What was it called? X-Cons. Yeah, X-Cons. And they are starting a a security business (laughs) where they design security systems for people. So Scott has this thing where he wants to take care of this new business because there's no way anyone's going to hire an ex-con. And he also needs to just not get in trouble and stay in his house for just a couple more days so that he doesn't go back to prison for violating his probation. But he also needs to help uh, Hope and Hank, who are super, super furious with him uh, because now they're on the run. And um, he's really pulled in a lot of different directions. And it primarily boils down to, in order to be a hero, um, he has to do stuff that will potentially sacrifice his relationship with his daughter if if he gets in trouble and has to go back to jail or go back into hiding in some way then he won't be able to see his daughter um, and it's a, just a, a nice little uh, detractor from the usual stuff that we see from uh, from other Marvel films um so lots of stuff happens I don't know how much detail you want me to go into or if you want to take it away <laughs> Well, we'll we'll go ahead and, and go from there. Yeah, the, the, this is definitely a very light-hearted movie. Uh, it definitely it, it was it was nice after Infinity War to kind of come down and just kind of ha- have a fun movie uh, as opposed to having to deal with something where like you know all existence is at stake or there's some major world shakeup uh, because that's sort of one of the problems that has that we had with sort of first few, the, the first bunch of uh, Marvel films is a lot of it was you know just about every single movie. Uh, the the fate of the world was at stake. You know, I, there's maybe mm, three films I can think of off the top of my head uh, that didn't deal with like world shattering implications. 
Uh, and it was nice to kind of bring the stakes down and just tell just a fun superhero story. And one of the things that I really loved about this movie is how everyone had a motivation. Nobody was just there to fill a slot or to to be the part of a centerpiece. Everybody had a reason to be in this movie. Everybody had a, had had something that they wanted and they were were working towards. In some cases, multiple uh, goals. Especially with Scott, he wants to help Hank and and Hope, uh, but he still wants to be you know kind of a good model citizen so that he doesn't wind going back to jail. You know, there was there was nobody in this movie that was pointless. Everybody was there for a purpose, and they all contributed to the film in a very real way. And I absolutely, I'm, I'm very impressed by how this movie managed to juggle all of its characters and have everybody feel like there's a reason for them to be there. Um, so there, there, you know, there was a bit kind of at the end, at the end during the mid credit scene, which we'll get to close to the end of the show, where I was like, oh God, really? Why'd you have to remind us of that? Um, but that was really the only real fly in the soup, uh, to borrow a bug pun. Um, but like I said, it just, it, it, this was a very fun and a very balanced movie, which is something that I don't really get to say about a lot of Marvel films, because a lot of times, like, okay, here's the big hero, and then everybody just kind of orbits around them. They don't really contribute in any real meaningful way. Um, not here. Everyone's got a reason to be there. Maybe that's because it's Ant-Man and the Wasp. It's not just Ant-Man. It's not Iron Man. It's not Thor. It It's, you know, it's a real, genuine partnership. Not a sidekick, but a partner. Well, I'm, I'm talking like on a grand scale. Like, you know, this was you well, know, no, this no, no, was no, no. this, well, this was I'm... an ensemble movie to me. That's the word I was looking for. Yes, and so what I'm trying to say is because that might have been the theme that they were going for when they were going for a partner film. So they didn't want anybody, you know, they didn't want somebody to outshine the other. Even though Ant Man is obviously like the lead. But it was a film where Wasp is his partner, so her story is just as important as his. Know what I mean? Yeah, and 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 I'm 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 kind of expanding it beyond just those two. Like, because like, you know, Hank had a story, Lewis had a story, every everyone had a story, and I love that the movie was able to juggle all of those. It wasn't just focused on just the two leads. Yes, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to explain to you that that's part of like the theme of it. Yeah is because the film is a partner film that it expands beyond, and that's one of its prevailing themes, is that everyone is important. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, so that's, that's, that's pretty much the plot of the film. So let's go ahead and start talking about uh, the cast of this movie. Um, and I'm going to start off um, by, I, I, like I said, I never saw um, the first Ant-Man, uh, but I saw, Scott, I saw Paul Rudd, Scott Lang in Civil War, and uh, he, you know, it was kind of just a taste of things to come. Um, a character that I really want to uh, kind of examine, though, is yeah, and I, I, I really was kind of jumping on here. I want to talk a bit about Hannah John Kamen as Ghost, the villain of this movie. Although even that's kind of a bit of a misnomer because, you know, yeah, she's an antagonist and she's out to cause she's she's causing the hero's trouble, but her motives, I I, I can't you can't call her motives really evil. Um, I, one of the, the, the jokes that I heard from a friend of mine when I went to go see this movie with them is this is the, 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 the great misunderstanding the movie where if everybody just sat down and just kind of talked to each other uh, you know they'd all realize that they're all kind of working towards the same goal um, but go, Ava you know Ava slash ghost um, her, st- her stick is basically she was caught in this lab accident when she was a child so now she's phasing in and out of reality and it's basically killing her. And the only way for her to stop it, this 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 condition from killing her, is if she can somehow extract the quantum energy from Janet Van Dyne when they extract when they extract her from the quantum realm. And it's one of those things where, like she's there and she's causing the, the the hero's problems, and she's a very persistent problem. Uh, but at the same time, you know, she's a character that's kind of like Killmonger in Black Panther. She has very human motivations, and she's not, you know, in unlike Killmonger, you know, she's not, she's not really evil. She's not, she's not trolling her mustache. She's not being villainous for the sake of being villainous. You really get the sense that this is someone who is desperate and on their, you know, this is her hail mary pass. And I love what the movie did with her as an antagonist in this movie, in that. 
you know, you you feel for her. And that's 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 really the only way I can really boil it down is you really feel for her throughout this whole movie. Yeah, there wasn't like any major like plot twist at the end where you find out, oh, she was really not that bad all along, and now I feel bad. It was really like you kind of get a lot of her story far enough into the film where at first you see her as a threat and then you see her as a threat, but you're like, you almost want her to just sit down and talk with everybody so that they won't fight and they can all get what they want. Because it is just so simple that everybody can get what they want if they would just (laughs) shut up and listen to each other. Um, And I was really pleased that this was one of the few films where they didn't actually kill the villain because she really really wasn't a villain. Uh, She was just a human being who was trying to survive. She was terrified all of the time. She was, you know, trying to, like, make a connection if she could, but if she couldn't, you know, then it was going to be whatever she could do to survive. And I kind of got the feeling that um, her condition was really, like, kind of making her insane. Like she was slowly losing her ability to rationalize based on uh, just the length of time she's had her condition and her level of suffering has just been so extraordinary for so long that um, she's starting to do things that she normally wouldn't do. And I also liked how, what was the name of Lawrence Fishburne's character? Bill Foster. Bill Foster um, was a wonderful little, I don't know what you would call him, his type of character. Compliment? He was a compliment to the uh, to the antagonist, where he obviously steps in, and you're like, "Oh my god, he's the bad guy. He's working with the bad guy." And then you find out, okay, his motivations is that he sees this, you know, this girl that he has worked with for most of her life at this point, probably has very fatherly feelings about her, and is trying to keep her alive again at all costs. But he has a line in the sand that he's not willing to cross. And when she crosses it, he, you know, turns and flips it. And, you know, is he's a reasonable character. And that's yeah. just, it's so wild to see that in a Marvel villain. Because usually Marvel villains are very motivated by their own greed or, you know, by one of the seven deadly sins. And these are just two people who are trying to help her survive. Um, and, you know, like, Ghost isn't terribly rational, but she's also, like, in tremendous amounts of pain all the time. And that Bill Foster is still a rational human being who doesn't want to give up his humanity even to help her. It's a really interesting dynamic. And what's great is that, you, you know, we have these two very human characters, and they, even though they're antagonists and they're causing trouble for the heroes, they never lose that humanity. There's a, there's a scene that I think you're kind of alluding to, and at, at this point I'm going to play the spoiler alarm here. Um, there's a scene where Ghost is about to go off, and she says, all right, well, I'll go and kidnap Scott's kid, uh, and that'll make him talk. And Bill puts his foot down and says, look, I've helped you up to this point, but if you lay one hand on that kid, then that's it. This this is over. I'm walking away. And, you know, you, ha- you have to expect that to be the moment where Ghost turns on him and kills him and goes off and you know, grabs uh, the daughter Cassie anyway, but no, she's like, she stops, she considers the position, says, alright, fine, I won't go after the kid, there's other options. And it's, it's, it's great to see that, I don't know, it adds a level of nuance to the hero-villain dynamic of this movie. Again, there's that word villain, I, which I really don't like using, because there, there is a villainous character in this, in this movie, but it's not them. Um, but it's great to see that it, it, it creates a very complex relationship between Scott and Hope and Hank and Bill and Ghost. Uh, that there's this there's this interesting interplay back and forth, and they're they're like foils to each other. They're both trying to achieve the same the same goals, uh, but they're coming at it from two different angles. And it's great to see that. It, I don't know. I guess it's just great to finally see an antagonist that's not a total monster, um, which we kind of really needed after Thanos. Um, but we've already had that discussion. 
Um, another character that I and I, this, this is going back to someone who's in the first film, but who wound up uh, being a real surprise to me for how funny he was was uh, Michael Pena as Lewis. Oh God, he's so amazing. <laughs> Was that uh, was that scene where they they, they, they they shoot him up with the with the, the not truth serum, but it's really truth serum, and he does that whole narration thing? Was that a carryover from the first film? Yes. Um, every time he's he tries to tell a story about something, there's an elaborate flashback of him narrating over it, and it goes really fast, and there's a lot of like detail that's completely irrelevant to everything, and that's that's what his character is like. He was like this surprise character from the first film who was so damn charming. Like, the the other two that he pals around with were funny, but they weren't that funny. And he sort of carries the extras um, by just being such a delight. He really is hysterical. I can't believe you haven't seen the first one. No, I need I need to go back. I need to go back and see it, but I just haven't had opportunity. But yeah, like in in the comedy in the comedy cake, Lewis is the cake, and then the two uh, the two other guys are just the icing. They're there to just provide that little extra touch. Um, and his main plot in this movie, uh, he's butting heads with. Let me find the guy's name here. Um. Oh, here we go. With uh, and his his main plot is he's butting heads with Walton Goggin, who plays Sonny Birch, a uh, weapons dealer. Who he enters into the story. He's got a component for the device that Hank and Hope are trying to build. Uh, but he sees, you know, dollar signs what they're trying to do, and he's trying to get a hold of the laboratory to basically do weapons dealer things. And I, I love that he was, he's, he's really the only real villainous character in this story, but even that, again, is a bit of a stretch because he's really just there to be an obstacle. Um, but I love Walton Goggins' performance uh, in this movie because it, it's... You ever watch a film and you you see a character a performance and you know that there's there's the, the there's the character's not really a huge bit to the movie but the actor's just having a ton of fun playing it regardless. I really got the sense that yeah. Goggins was having a lot of fun with this character. He just he just oozes charisma in every scene he's in and you just get the sense that he's just having an absolute blast being in this movie. I get the feeling maybe he's just a tiny bit supposed to be making fun of other Marvel villains um, because he is one of those types where um, he he comes off as very similar to a lot of other Marvel villains but he's just thwarted at every turn and embarrassed and lots of bad stuff happens to him and you're like yeah yeah you're hilarious like you can't really hate him because he doesn't like ever succeed at anything that he sets out to do <laughs> and and you feel bad for him like right at the end especially when 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 ant-man is all giant and he just like flicks him with his finger oh god yeah oh no the best part was uh, like right at the end well they fill all those bad guys up with the truth serum <laughs> 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 and then he talks about how the health code violations of all the restaurants he owns. Some of which I'm sure will shock you. <laughs> like to me, that is just like wah, icing on the cake. Uh, <laughs> what, were, what were some other characters uh, that you uh, you were particularly enamored with in this film? Oh, uh, the the one FBI agent. Oh, uh, the Jimmy, one who was Jimmy Wu, played by Randall Park. Yes, he was hysterical. He, there's a guy who's just trying. He's just really trying. And he's, like, actually a nice guy. He's not, you know, like, scumbag FBI agent or jerk face or anything. He's he's, he's Phil Coulson without the competence. Yes. <laughs> um, where he's just, he's trying to get through his day and, and he has suspicions. And then he's like, oh, no, no, I was wrong. Okay. And then he really, like, his thing where he's trying to learn the card tricks... <laughs> It's also really funny. Um, every time they came back and raided Scott's house, it was just priceless. Where he's like, oh, darn it, I thought we had him this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he really provides a lot of the uh, the moments for Scott to really just, just bounce off of somebody. Um, one of the moments that I really enjoyed was where... I think it's I think it's at the end after they've removed the the the, the leg bracelet and he's getting ready to go and he's like I'll I'll, I'll be seeing you Scott. Scott's like what you mean like are, are you inviting me out to dinner 
What? No. Why would I? Why would I? Why would I be in, inviting you to dinner? No. I mean, like, I'll I'll see you, like, around. Like, I mean, do you want to grab dinner? <laughs> <laughs> I just meant like the next time you do something, I'm gonna catch you. But I mean, do you want to do dinner? <laughs> I just felt like I felt so bad for him like he really needed a friend or something (laughs) so good you know what would be great is you know if we get a third movie it's them two like shooting the shit at a bar (laughs) like like Scott um, you know teaching him card tricks and stuff (laughs) like they did dinner because he doesn't have any friends (sighs) god that'd be great (laughs) <laughs> um, now another character that I want to talk about, uh, and this is again going back to characters from the from the first movie. Um, God, they do not have their cast list here in anything resembling a readable order. Okay, here we go, and that's uh, that's Michael Douglas's Hank Pym, uh, who, God, if you ever like. Was he as much of a ball buster in the first film as he was in this one? Because God, he's like he reminded me of like every, how everyone's got that one uncle who like you know, no matter what you do, he just busts your balls and just gives you shit. Like you, you yes. like you know they care about you, you know they want what's best for you, but at the same time, Jesus Christ, dude, fucking slow down. Yes, um, there was a, a a bit of a different dynamic because in the first film, um, Hank needed Scott. He basically recruited Scott to be the new Ant-Man because he was just getting too old to do it himself. And he wanted somebody who he would consider expendable to don the suit rather than um, have himself or his daughter don the suit or any version of the suit. Um, and But that was something that Scott understood very quickly was, I'm here because I'm expendable. Hope you're the one who's not expendable. So there was a, a very different dynamic where... Um, you know, they spent a lot of time, like, pissed off at Scott because he was terrible at things and they fought a lot. But they also needed him. And in this film, Scott caused them more headaches than normal. <laughs> um, and was more of a hindrance to their work. But they, they needed him again, as they found out, because of his connection with Janet. And Janet, oh boy... That was such an exciting thing. I'm so, so happy with how everything with Janet turned out. Well, then I guess that that that, that gives you the floor. Let's talk about Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet Van Dyne. Uh, because first off, only Michelle Pfeiffer could be lost in the quantum realm for like 30 years and still have the most amazing eyelashes. <laughs> it was literally, I was like, she, she took off that whatever she was wearing and I'm like, damn, she's got good eye makeup on. Like... <sighs> She looks so good. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it was interesting because first we, we get, you know, a little blip of, you know, seeing Janet in a flashback um, and then like a dream sequence. Uh, but the really stunning part was when Janet temporarily possesses Scott. <laughs> and they, like, everybody realizes it but Scott and it's Scott not being Scott and it was really really entertaining to watch that play out um, oh it was hysterical and it, it was hysterical and it also it's one of those cases where you get, a, you get a real insight into a character without the character actually being there and the one of the things I think is really brilliant about Michelle Pfeiffer's casting with Janet uh, is you know, you get the sense over the, you know, like I mentioned that Hank throughout this movie, he's the ball buster. He just keeps, just keeps beating down on, uh, on Scott. And he's a character who it's established is, you know, very much needs to have, have things go his way and have things be done the way he wants them done. And I really got the sense both in that exchange where, uh, Janet was possessing Scott and also through Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer's screen interaction. I really got the sense that, Janet was the the sort of the 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 calming influence in Hank's life that he was that she was the one who reined him in and brought him and and kept him grounded and brought him back to earth and you know you get the and, and you get the sense of these two people who just they complement each other so completely and so beautifully um and I 
I, I, every time I see Michelle Pfeiffer in a movie, I'm always blown away by her performance, and this was no exception. Um, she was absolutely brilliant uh, in this role, even for how for how little screen time she had compared to the rest of the characters. She absolutely stole the show close to the end of the film there. Yeah, um, she's just so beautiful, so talented, so warm. She it just exuded warmth in this role. Um, and And I was so surprised that they got a happy ending because I'm not used to like a completely happy ending out of a Marvel film and especially not out of the last couple of Marvel films. I thought for sure that getting Janet back would come at such a cost that it would probably be like the death of Hank would be the only thing like it would that like that would be the trade off. That, that Hank would sacrifice himself to bring back Janet or something like that. I thought for sure right. they were going to do that. Right, but no, every, everybody got a happy ending. Even even Ghost got a happy ending because the first thing that that you know Janet does is she comes out of the quantum realm after you know of course saying hello to everybody to you know her family and doing the whole I'm so proud of you bit. You know she stops and she's like, okay, I, I see what's going on with you. Let me help you. And then it's established uh, in a kind of a throwaway line in the mid credit scene that they're they're doing what they're doing to continue helping her. So like, you know, it's one of those do- it's one of those Doctor Who everyone lives moments where everybody gets what they want, um, except for poor yeah, Jimmy Woo who doesn't get his arrest. But you know, <laughs> yeah. But again, if if we see later that they went out and shot the shit at, over dinner at like a pool hall or something, I'd be very satisfied. <laughs> But, but yeah, um, like it, it was so surprising that everybody everybody lived just this once, Rose. Everybody lived, um, and and that you know, like I, I feel like that would do so much good for Hank's character to have Janet back, and and obviously like the the continuous innovations that they will probably do over the next couple of movies, depending on how Infinity Wars two goes. Mm. Um, you know, they can, they together are going to make such a great pair that the continuous innovations of the Ant-Man suit and the Wasp suit are probably just going to get cooler and cooler. Um, and and hopefully everybody lives happily ever after. It was such a treat to have that happen. Okay. Any other characters that you want to talk about? Oh, gosh. No, I could go on about a Bill and Ghost's relationship forever because I was just so... <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, and I guess let's uh, let's 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 talk a bit, a bit about the presentation of this movie. And um, one of the things that I really noticed about this film was, again, how grounded it was, how down to earth it was as far as its presentation. Um, again, there wasn't any like like there were set pieces, sure, but they weren't as huge or grandiose as you would normally see in like a Marvel film. But at the same time, they worked and they were really fun to watch. Um, the one that I really enjoyed the most was uh, the was the giant Ant Man <laughs> using the broken down truck as a scooter <laughs> to roll down to the San Francisco street like a giant scooter slash skateboard. I thought that was just so that I thought that was just just so funny to see. A lot of this movie's presentation is in its is in its how, the cleverness of its visuals. There's just a lot of really funny sight gags. Um, the only thing that I really had a complaint with was uh, the giant ants, um, which I don't know. They just they they, they look kind of wonky to me for whatever reason. I don't know. Were those were those CGI or were those practical effects? Oh, they were probably CGI'd, but um, they were definitely in the last film too. Yeah. Um, but uh, no. Once again, this film really knocks it out of the ballpark in terms of using scale to create just really entertaining visuals. Uh, one of my favorite parts is when Hope throws that salt shaker and then makes it big and then the dude like smacks his face into it. <laughs> like it's that kind of delightful cheap shots that are another wonderful character first film. The giant Hello Kitty Pez dispenser delightful absolutely delightful i will say um, there was a missed opportunity with that i am so disappointed that we didn't see the giant pez dispenser's head roll back and a giant pez candy come out yeah well that probably would have cost an extra couple million dollars to animate <laughs> um but uh, it, it there was just a lot of really fun stuff i don't think they did as many um small scale fights like the previous film 
because the previous film had somebody else in a shrinking suit as the villain. So there was a lot of scale fights that were really fun to watch because obviously it's taking place in like a kid's bedroom. Um, so, you know, in the previous film, Ant-Man versus Yellow Jacket uh, had a lot of really fun visuals with, you know, the, the train fight and everything. So we didn't get as much of that in this film because he was fighting another person-sized person. Um, but still very entertaining. So I think they went big a lot more to sort of balance off the fact that they weren't going to go small quite as much. Oh. And obviously the giant the giant Scott just being a monster. Ah, so funny. So funny. Yeah. Also, I liked that they showed that him going giant has consequences. Um, which, which I don't think we really got out of Civil War per se, but it, it makes sense, and we're not shown it very often, that that powers come at a cost. And that when he goes big, it expends so much energy that it starts to make him very, very tired, and then he passes out. That's not a huge consequence unless you're in the middle of the goddamn bay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to drown. <laughs> One of the one of the, the moments I like where they played with scale was we're in the woods and uh, they're they're leaving the lab and Hank goes to his remote and the uh, the lab shrinks and they're like surrounded the whole they're <laughs> surrounded by FBI guys. Oh, that was really good. <laughs> oh, and the the Hot Wheels, the little thing with all the Hot Wheels in it now. <laughs> yes. And Louise is just like, oh, are you kidding me? See, here here's the part that 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 that, that I laughed about that was they have all these cars uh, in this Hot Wheels thing. That means they had to go out and find those cars, I guess buy those cars. That means at some point, Hank Pym had to go to a car dealership, point to this flame embroiled Honda, and say, I want that. That is right up my alley. <laughs> Maybe he bought it online. <laughs> Under a shell corporation. Um, and, and it's clearly like the decoy car because Hank Pym would never actually drive that car. Oh, Not current Hank Pym. Maybe, like, in a flashback, a much younger Hank Pym might have driven a car with flames on it. But not current Hank Pym. <laughs> so, but yeah, this 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 movie, it's just, it's... It's just a very fun film in general. That's really all I... That's really the only way that I can describe it. It's just a lot of fun. And it's fun in a way that very few of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies have been. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's catharsis, really, because after, after Infinity War, uh, that was just fun and lighthearted, and then they had to go and fucking throw a wrench in the works of that mid-credits scene, my god. Well, you kind of had to know it was coming, that, um, since they didn't up front with Ant-Man and the Wasp specifically state that it took place you know, before or after any particular event other than Civil War, you had to know that it was taking place just before Infinity War. So I expected a mid credit singer to go pretty much exactly like it did. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's like getting a root canal. You know it's cutting and you know it has to happen. It doesn't make it any less unpleasant. No, no, it was brutal. It, it was actually one of the more terrifying... So, the mid credit stinger is exactly what you'd think it'd be for something that takes place directly before Infinity War. Uh, they have a little mission where Scott's going to go down into the quantum... Is he going into the quantum realm again? Yeah. I believe so. Um, using some new tech that they devised uh, to make it safe to travel and come back in a very short amount of time. Um, and they're harvesting some sort of energy there so that they can continue to help Ghost... Um, and he's he's in the quantum realm. He's just zipped off. And uh, Janet and Hank and Hope are all just standing by, waiting to pull him back. And then, poof, they're gone. See, I probably would have been... I think here's what bothers me about the mid credit stinger. Is it because it's the mid credit stinger? Um, and then they have, after the, the rest of the credits, they have a little funny thing with the, the, with the giant ants. And I'm like, I would have put the, the thing with the giant ant as the mid credit stinger and then saved the, 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 the poof for the end of the credits. 
because um, I get kind of I got kind of the case of mood whiplash going from that really downer oh they all disintegrated mid credit stinger to the little funny bit with the ant at the end. Well, maybe they just wanted to uh, to again like just put a little band aid on it. But it was also it wasn't just like oh ho ho that's really funny. There's an ant playing the drums. It's also to go oh look the whole world is in shambles around this ant. And the, the public broadcasting alarm is on. And shit's going on, but this ant is going on his daily routine. <laughs> he's just he's just playing rock band. <laughs> yeah, like the whole world is falling apart around this one ant. <laughs> um, and and uh, so there was uh, Scott was one of the heroes where because he wasn't in Infinity War, we didn't know where he ended up on the here or there, you know, where he ended up on the spectrum of alive or dead. And clearly he is alive at the end of it, but he's stuck in a place that he can't get out of. And that to me might actually be more horrifying. Like, I'm so worried. I'm sure they'll come up with some bullshit way that he gets out of the quantum realm and they'll explain it away in the next Infinity War. But that would be so terrifying. And then he's going to pop out of there somehow at some point and everything is going to have gone to... Yeah, so, but, like, just, oh, that mid credit stinger, yeah, just didn't do anything, just, 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 it mm, made me feel bad after a really fun movie. So, but anyway, <sighs> we're, 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 we're running kind of long here, so we need to kind of start wrapping things up. So let's start wrapping things up by giving our final general thoughts on Ant-Man as a film. So, Kat, what are your final summarized thoughts on this movie? Really, really excellent sequel um, to a really excellent first film. Um, carries the torch over from the first Ant-Man very, very well. Um, love the thinking outside the box in terms of antagonists. Great, great humor. A good soundtrack, too. Uh, had a couple songs stuck in my head after that. Um, once again, just very entertaining visuals, entertaining characters. It was really, really nice to see the Wasp in full action, because as much as we've talked about Scott, it was a whole lot Hope's story as well. We didn't really touch on it, but it is pretty 50-50 on Hope's story. Um, And so it was really nice to see her character arc and um, and to see the the Pym Van Dyne family reunited. Um, It gives me a lot of hope for a future Ant-Man film to be even more entertaining and to have more Michelle Pfeiffer in it. Very, very excited to see where it goes from here. Really, really excellent film. All right, yeah, and, and like like I said many times over the course of the episode, this is just a fun movie. Like it's it's is the definition of a popcorn film. Um, just a really enjoyable, really fun, really entertaining movie. Um, and I, you know, there's really not but any higher praise that I can give uh, than that. Is that this is just it's just a, a fun movie? It really is. Um, so anyway, so this is the part of the show where we give our final ratings on the film. As always, our best to worst. See it now. Wait for matinee. Wait for DVD. Wait for cable. Don't even bother. And Brian's rating. Fuck this movie. So, Kat, what's your final rating on Ant-Man and the Wasp? Um, go see it. Go see it now. Apparently, it's really good, even if you've seen the first Ant-Man film. Gonzo. Yeah, I, I, I can attest. If you've not seen the first one, you can, as long as you've seen Civil War, you can see this movie and understand what's going on. Yes. It does help, though, if you've seen the first film, because you get all of the side characters who are just very entertaining. Um, it, it's such a great film. All of the character interactions are great. It's, it's sort of different than any other Marvel film that's out there in, in where it places its values. Um, and what it's trying to achieve other than just being highly, highly entertaining. So go see it now. All righty. And uh, that's about all the time that we have for this week. You guys, next week, uh, thank you as always for tuning in. I'm Dr. Guns. I'm the cat. We will see you next week. Taka, play us out. <laughs>